Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Amanda Poss and I am the gallery director for Hillsborough Community College. Today we celebrate Reverberations, Black Artists on Racism and Resilience, curated by our very own Desmond Clark. This exhibition is on view at Gallery 221 at HCC Dale Mabry campus now through March 3rd. If you haven't had a chance to see it yet in its previous iterations at the Woodson Museum or at the University of Tampa, or if you'd like to see it again, we welcome you to come back and see it in our galleries at the Dale Mabry campus during our open hours. Initiated by the Woodson African American Museum of Florida, Reverberations is a traveling exhibition that shares artwork from emerging and established Black artists who live and work in Tampa Bay and across the Southeastern United States. Through each artist's own perspectives, this exhibition will challenge viewers with stories of structural racism and oppression, as well as celebrate hope and resilience. A few quick notes before we get started. As you may have noticed, we are recording tonight's event. Uh, all of our published event recordings for the HCC Art Galleries can be found on our YouTube page at HCCFL underscore Art Galleries. Participants are also muted, which you might have noticed. However, this does not mean we don't want to hear from you, rather the opposite, in fact. So at any time during the event, if you hear something that you want to affirm or a comment that you really liked or a question, please go ahead and leave that in the chat at any time during tonight's event. We'll be addressing the questions at the end of the event in the order in which they appear. On a personal note, I just wanted to say that we're so pleased to be the third host for Reverberations. Um, and the spring semester is always really a special time for us at the HCC Art Galleries. Every year we honor a very long-standing collaboration with the Tampa Bay Black Heritage Festival by celebrating and amplifying voices of Black artists. And it's really our privilege to host such an outstanding group of artists through this exhibition in 2022. I'd also like to acknowledge this year's partnership with the Woodson African American Museum of Florida as the catalyst and inaugural host of Reverberations. So special thanks to William Sanders, Ruby Jackson, and Ursula Odom on behalf of the festival, as well as Terry Lipsy Scott, who's joining us tonight, who coordinated exhibition and marketing efforts on behalf of the Woodson. And a few more acknowledgements before we begin our program. So my thanks goes to the HCC Student Government Association who funds all of our events and exhibitions throughout the year. We literally couldn't do what we do without them. So I applaud their efforts in supporting diversity, arts and education, both for our students at Hillsborough Community College and our larger Tampa Bay community. I'd also like to acknowledge our HCC Dale Mabry campus president, Dr. Paige Niehaus and our interim Dean, Amy Bousquet for their support of the HCC art galleries throughout the year. I'd like to say thank you to all of our artists and art lenders without whom this exhibition would not be possible. And also a special thank you to my gallery team, Emiliano Setacasi, Michael Murphy, Alyssa Miller, our student workers, Alex Suarez, V. Pham, and Anna Mary Insomalis, many of whom are working behind the scenes to make all the magic happen tonight. Um, so thank all of you for your tireless efforts in helping us coordinate the many facets of the exhibition in tonight's event. Last but certainly not least, my heartfelt appreciation to Desmond Clark, our curator, as well as our panelists this evening. I'm really looking forward personally to our conversation tonight, and I'm excited for the opportunity to share your work and your experiences with our community. Um, as I introduce each of our panelists, if they're with us, go ahead and turn on your cameras if you haven't already and unmute. Um, so I'll start with Desmond Clark, who I've I've mentioned as our guest curator and also the moderator for tonight's program. He is a fine art preparator and curator as well as the principal and co-founder of St. Kate Fine Arts. Joining us this evening, we have some esteemed guests zooming in both locally as well as from afar. First, I'd like to introduce Terry Lipsy Scott, who's the executive director of the Woodson African American Museum of Florida, was longtime resident of St. Petersburg and longtime advocate for equity and diversity. I'd also like to introduce Basil Barrington Watson, who's an internationally celebrated Jamaican sculptor and painter who's been working as an artist for more than 40 years. And then we have Jeremy G. Bell, who's a Seattle-based painter, best known for his complexly layered portraits of contemporary Black subjects. Welcome, each of you. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Desmond Clark for tonight's panel. 
Thank you, Amanda. And thank all of you for joining us this evening. This is indeed an honor to uh, have this opportunity to again uh, show the, these wonderful works. Um, it's a much smaller show than we've had at all the other places. However, uh, I feel like it's a very impactful show uh, nonetheless, because uh, the pieces, uh, there's a lot of intimacy with the pieces in, the, in Gallery 221, um, and it just represents the work very well. Um, I'd like to, to open up very at the very top with um, a conversation that Terry and I had that uh, led to even beginning this show in the first place. And uh, it was because she got a phone call from the James Museum here in St. Petersburg uh, offering her space. And she called me and asked me if I could put together this exhibition. Why on earth? I will have to leave it up to her to explain. But um, nonetheless, I'm, I had never been a curator before. Uh, I'd never even thought about curating a show before. So I had to find a way to, to relate to this show. And uh, music is my, my, my forte. And so I always wanted to find the show to have one word as the title. Uh, and that one word uh, I landed upon was rever reverberations, which is a term in music. Um, and it was in, it was poignant for me because of the relationship with reverberations for music, as well as reverberations for what's happening with uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in America. And that is that uh, things that have happened for years um, that we thought only happened way back when uh, are still happening today. But because of the fact that it's been rebranded or it's been uh, it's become a taboo subject, uh, or people just uh, avoiding recognizing it for what it is, we're not actually calling it what it is. And so reverberations was just my way of actually trying to say uh, what the same thing is happening today that happened back in the day, and we just need to be able to talk about it. It doesn't have to be an animosity a conversation full of animosity, but it needs to be a conversation and it needs to happen regularly. Otherwise we get to the point where we just start ignoring things and everything becomes incredibly polarized, which is where we are today. So I'm just gonna start out by asking Terry, what made you decide to call me? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am Terry Lipsy Scott, Executive Director of the Dr. Carter G. Woodson African American Museum currently known as the Whitson African American Museum of Florida. And Desmond, uh, before I get there, Amanda, heartfelt thanks and gratitude to you and the college for continuing our show in this extraordinary exhibit. Desmond, you and your husband Thaddeus have worked tirelessly over the years. In fact, installing beautiful exhibits in museums across our city, across our state, across our nation. And yet you had never been afforded the opportunity, to my knowledge, to in fact curate that that you do so fabulously. It became just an easy, easy ask for me, for you to consider pulling together an opportunity for us that was afforded by the James Museum. So with that, I was emotional to the point of tears for your acceptance and willingness to curate this exhibit, which you've done fabulously. And the Woodson in our community, thank you. Those tears, Those tears didn't tears. stop after that conversation that we had <laughs> because I remember not being in the gallery and having the people tell me what happened when you first walked into the James Museum and saw all the pieces there. But there was one particular piece that you had a really emotional reaction to. Tell me more about that. Well, needless to say, almost every piece within the exhibit evoked emotions, but one in particular happened to be that that was sculptured by Basil and it's entitled Grace. 
this image almost without in just consistently move me to tears because so often over the past few years, what we have heard consistently was nothing more than make America great, make America great, make America great. And for me, there could be no consideration given to America's greatness without given consideration to the individuals who indeed made it great. And every time I saw this image of this sculpture, all I can think about were the black women who sacrifice their bodies, their families, in order to ensure that we had a nation that was built on their backs in more ways than one. They gave of their children. They were separated from their husbands. Their families were divided so that others might reap the benefit from the cotton that they planted and that they picked, from the tobacco that they sowed and they pick for well, building of roads and just countless buildings, African and African-Americans in no small part, but in large part is indeed responsible for the greatness that this nation celebrate today. So even seeing Grace again tonight, I become emotional and my eyes fill with tears knowing that we owe a debt of gratitude to black women particularly, but the African-American culture. When, the, when, we, when the date was selected to open the show, I don't think at the time we were aware of how significant that date was going to become. And then it happened. And what we're, the date that we're talking about is the date that this, the very first reverberations opened at the James Museum again. And it was on June 19th of last year. And as most of you may already know, June 19th became a national holiday, recognized as a national holiday yesterday, making the opening of this exhibition even more powerful. Um, and the entire run of the exhibition at all of the locations, um, and I've already heard from uh, staff at the Hillsborough Community College at Gallery 221 that those have visited that those that have visited the exhibition so far have already started to experience the emotion that we intended from this exhibition. Um, tell me more about how it was for you to be part of an exhibition that opens up at a time that we weren't really expecting to get the recognition for Emancipation Day. And that's, it's a rec recognition for Juneteenth, but there still is some turmoil around recognition of Juneteenth. Desmond, it just fascinates me how the stars continue to align regarding almost everything we do. When this idea was presented, as you stated, we had no idea that we would be able to have been able to celebrate it from a national perspective. And what we do at the Woodson African American Museum is preserve, present, interpret, and celebrate African American history. So how <laughs> Again, I'm becoming extremely emotional how timely it was for the stars to align at that time for us to be able to celebrate in a way that we weren't doing it in a silo, but those everywhere are now being forced to recognize the contributions of African-Americans and the history and the so many stories that are yet to be told. And in this exhibit, it forced individuals to look at life 
and through a different lens. In so many different ways and conversations that have been had since we have created this exhibit, as you stated earlier, the conversations are rich. Folks are wanting to know more. Mm -hmm. They're wanting to understand more. They're wanting to engage more. So the importance of what we're doing is certainly not limited to our community or our county or the Bay Area, but through a broader lens throughout the nation. Jeremy, I, I wanted to bring you into the conversation here um, and talk about uh, a couple of the pieces that are in the, in the exhibition, but particularly um, a piece that isn't actually in this exhibition was the first piece that, that we got from you for the first exhibition. Uh, it was an untitled portrait of yourself from uh, 2015. And one of the things that I remember about uh, writing about this portrait was um, the process that you went through to create the portrait. You took several photos of yourself. You looked at uh, social media photos of yourself. Um, but the image that came out was this very natural image, um, black man, natural hair, full lips, just beautiful. But what's even more striking about it is when you get into uh, the conversation of, or the composition of the piece itself, um, being that it's acrylic and charcoal and scented wax and uh, that's on, on wood. So there's a texture and there's scent and there's, uh, layers that uh, you, you, you are known to put in all of your pieces. Can you tell us what, or if there's anything that you're conveying from all these complex combinations? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, for me, can we pull the image back up? Yeah, so, I mean, what the process starts to convey is, um, this combination between um, the natural, the tangible, and the intangible, right? So I really love working on wood because no two pieces are the same. They're all different. They have this unique character to them, no matter what. Um, and it has this really natural, earthy, kind of grounded element, right? And then the abstraction, for me, it starts to, um, speak to the notion of the grandiose, the, the universe at large, the unexplainable, the serendipity, that kind of um, unique thread that runs through each individual person and gives them their own uniqueness. Um, for me, the abstraction really starts to think about that idea and that concept uh, in the way that I'm actually creating uh, the work. I'm physically picking up the painting, moving it around, letting the, um, paint, move and interact with the wood, with other materials. And by doing that process, um, the abstractions will always be different and always be unique and, and not even um, replicable. You know, you could probably sit down and do it by hand maybe, but th that process will be different and it won't be um, this unique kind of organic structure that is within the base of the figure. Um, and then you marry that with the individual. So you have all of these kind of like really complicated grand concepts that are then boiled down into this individual. And what then does that make the individual? How much of that person, that individual, that subject um, is being seen beyond the scope of whatever quote unquote stereotypes might be assigned to them. So when you think about, um, I mean, we're all very familiar with uh, the conversations that are being had about the 1619 project, but particularly what, what brought on the whole idea of talking about 1619, and that is the um, removal or the abduction of uh, black people from their, their primary country, from their homes, from their family, from their children, placed on a ship uh, or several ships, um, forced to defend this ship as it 
traverses across troubled waters, uh, having being looted by pirates, actually being moved from one ship to another because the original ship was overpowered by the pirates. And then they arrive in a new country, completely unfamiliar to them, uh, have no idea where they're going to live, what they're going to eat, what they're going to do for work. Um, and this is America. This is what uh, Black people from the early 1600s endured. And uh, when, all, when all something like that happens, it, you start to lose your identity at that point. And so I'm wondering if, if there is any relationship with your pieces and what would be considered the Black identity. So that is, um, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. And um, I love uh, the title, Reverberations. And so I, I'm kind of thinking about my work in terms of that, not necessarily, well, somewhat yes in this, this moment here in the present, but also how does my work reverberate throughout history? You know, how are people going to interact with my pieces, you know, 10 years, 15 years, God willing, 100 years from now, right? And so that's why a lot of times I'm really intentional about stripping my figures down. There's not really a lot of stereotypes, you know, um, at least negative stereotypes, I guess you could say. Um, rap music, basketball, NFL, gangster, all whatever you want to try to just there are stereotypes out there associated with Black culture. And I usually try to avoid those so that I'm really just left with the subject the expression, the emotion, and when I'm able to whittle it down to those basic, you know, human response or modes of being, I'm able to um, step past all of that and really get to the essence of the person. And sometimes that's hard to explain, but I know that I've captured it when someone looks at my work and they say, that reminds me of, you know, whether it be an auntie, whether it reminds them of themselves, whether it reminds them of a moment in time, a cousin, a coworker. It's almost like people are making a connection with the subject, and it's a connection beyond um, what's physically there. So thinking in terms of Black people um, and the greater culture, I think that's one of the kind of unique things about our situation and how we've kind of progressed through time is we're continuously evolving. Um, but beyond that, I've actually just recently created a piece that kind of touches on what you're talking about. I call it Instill Shining. It's like you have this group of people that have been extracted. I mean, what a crazy, crazy concept using new languages, new family structures, new land. Um, and yet somehow, some way, and still shining. So um, I think my work really tries to get at that part of it. You know, it's like, yes, there was definitely that, <laughs> you know, that took place. Um, and we're dealing with the ramifications of it because it was such a grave atrocity, right? You just can't wipe that away. But even considering that, you're left with some beautiful subjects, you know. Absolutely. And Terry, I wanted to get back to um, the Woodson and particularly, uh, you know, this year we have a new mayor, Ken Welsh as a new mayor. And uh, he's not just the first black mayor in St. Petersburg, but he's a product of St. Petersburg, particularly a product of the gas plant and the Deuces neighborhood. And what's notable about the Deuces neighborhood, as you can speak to as well, is that it's the home of the Woodson currently and the new location. And so I am wanting to hear more about, or, or tell me, how does it feel to you, or what is it going to be like to you having a mayor that, that finally understands what it is that the neighborhood that you have held together with the Woodson for so long, using the Woodson as a, as a, a conduit to hold this, this, this neighborhood and this area for a while um, together. How is it going to um, help you now that you have a mayor that 
potentially understands what it is that, that the people in your area are dealing with and figuring out a way to incorporate that to make the Woodson better for not just St. Petersburg and not just make St. Petersburg better, but to make Florida better. It's interesting that you should ask that question. Reverberations again, it signals yet a message, even in this space and regarding your question. The front of our current location, there is a placard there. And on that placard is the name David Welch. David Welch is Ken Welch's father. And he was an integral part of our local government. In fact, he was serving on St. Petersburg Housing Authority when the doors of the Woodson open. And I am just ecstatic about the idea that his son now has become the mayor of this city. And it is my prayer that his name will be erected on that new museum. Here we are, reverberations. And your question regarding the role that Ken Welch is now serving in as a mayor of our city. This is the first time in our city's history that an individual with lived experiences can actually relate to the African-American experience. We have forever as a people had to endure, embrace, and live through the eyes of others. The opportunity will now exist for a gentleman of color, an African-American male, to know what it's like to actually have experience <clears throat> the resentment, the, the, the degradation, the separation, and so much more that goes with the life of an African-American. We now have someone who clearly understand the need of a community. Here in the city of St. Petersburg, where we tout, Afri where we tout art and history and museums and the like, the Woodson is housed in a public housing community center. What was a public housing community center? And I say consistently, as a city, as a county, as a state, as an area, we're better than that. Here in the state of Florida, there is not one properly constructed African-American museum. When we can go to places like Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee and Georgia, and now South Carolina, where there are properly constructed African-American museums and here we are in the state of Florida, and one doesn't exist. It is my hope and my prayer that the creation of Florida's first purpose-built African-American museum will be, become the legacy of our current mayor and that we might celebrate with pride the preservation of African-American history and its culture. Wow, wow. <laughs> that's pretty powerful. Um, so the Woodson, when it started, was the Carter G. Woodson African-American Museum, uh, Carter G. Woodson African-American History Museum, I think it was, or just Carter G. Woodson African-American Museum. And now it's just the Woodson Museum of Florida. The Woodson African-American Museum. Of Florida. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So the name change actually is very effectual as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it's, I believe it is, it, it changes the mission of the museum and as well as the scope of the museum. How do you guys, how, do you, how are you wrapping your head around that? To be quite honest, I work with an extraordinary board and they're visionaries and they clearly understand the dynamics 
associated with how we need to move forward in telling our story, serving our story, and communicating the art and the culture. And for anyone who knows, an African-American museum is more than just a building that's filled with art and artifacts. It's a space where folks rally together around social justice. We're there to accommodate those with housing needs, with education needs, those who in fact are just finding themselves asking questions that have been unanswered for far too long. We find ourselves the epicenter, if you will, of everything relating to the needs, to the success, to the celebration of African-Americans in the culture. So with the board of the Woodson, and now with those who are in fact um, taking on the charge of being leaders in the space of our capital campaign, we recognize the value of not just being St. Petersburg's African-American Museum, our Pinellas County's African-American Museum, our Tampa Bay's African-American Museum. We are to be now Florida's African-American Museum. And we are excited about what's before us and how we will achieve the goal of doing just that. So there's a question I'm looking online right now and I see there's a question to Jeremy from Michael Standard that says, this is uh, one of the striking things about your work in this exhibition to me is how it depicts the spaces between realistic forms and the intangible identity of the individual. Can you talk about the process of selecting materials which help you to get to this space between? Well, I totally appreciate the, the comment. And um, I think um, it's just kind of a, a little bit of my training and my nature. I've always been artistic, you know, just so I've always been a creator and a maker. Um, charcoal is one of my favorite materials because it's so um, versatile. But then, of course, you know, when you're in art school, you're learning to use acrylics and oils. Um, but I will say, I think more so than others, I just right off the gate was very interested in how different materials interact with each other. Um, I, and I think the reason for that is there's moments or there's the opportunity for surprise, right? Like if you don't know how something's gonna interact <laughs> with each other, you know, do a little test on the side and see like, oh, wow, these are creating cells and this is creating streaks. And, you know, where can I explore this territory? How far does it go? How far can I push it? You know, what are the darks like versus what are the lights like? And what do those two things do when you put them together? You know, so um, it's almost like creating a narrative without a narrative and leaving that space for interpretation. And I guess that's kind of where the connection comes where people can say, I'm seeing something in this. Um, I also like the little moments, especially with the abstractions, you get these, these moments where people can kind of fill in the blanks for themselves. I did a piece, um, self-portrait life size, and there was a lot of abstraction in there. And it was kind of talking about current events and things like that. And people were saying, oh, I, I see a gun over here. I see a knife over there. And did you do this on purpose? And I'm like, no, I did not. <laughs> but I did do, um, I did create the space for that interpretation to happen. And that's what I, that's what I really enjoy because I'll, I'll be honest, I can sit with works that I've created. And you know, a month later, I'm like, wow, I haven't seen that before. And so the work um, continues to grow and interact with the viewer, depending on where, where they are, what the lighting is like, um, and all of that. To me, those are really exciting opportunities that I, I like to explore. I see that Basil has joined us, and I'd, I'd like to bring him into the conversation and welcome him um, to, to, to the conversation as well. Can you, is he, is he there? Are you there, Basil? Yes. Uh, yes, awesome. I'm here. Sorry uh, for you being are. Yes. So, Basil, your father, also named Basil Barrington uh, Watson, 
was a well-known painter in Jamaica and also taught at Spelman College in Atlanta. Um, he was also the subject of the uh, of a Lenny White or Lenny Little White's 2015 documentary film called "They Call Me Barrington." Uh, the film tells how your father felt art was more than a hobby. And you were bestowed with an honor of distinction by the Jamaican parliament. You have works in Montego Bay, as well as downtown Atlanta, just to name a few. And there are several of your sculptures that we have in the, the reverberations exhibition. And the one that has impacted visitors the most, which we've already spoken about this evening as well, is the grace. What inspired you to make such a, a poignant image? Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, about the grace, it's a very early sculpture in my career. Uh, it was done in 1986. I graduated from the Jamaica School of Art, now the Edna Manning College, in 1980. So it's uh, six years after graduating. I was still exploring the human figure is my main interest and has been the, the theme of my exploration for, for all of my career, I would say. And um, at that time, I was really searching myself, uh, searching the world, searching what genre, what I wanted to express, how could I use the figure um, in, in my uh, um, in my work and, and what themes I wanted to express. It, it was a very political time. Um, South Africa was um, apartheid issues and Africa in general was raging. The, these, these were very topical issues that um, were on the forefront as well as Jamaica's own uh, history of slavery, colonialism, um, independence, uh, self-assertion, and so on, and how it related to Africa. And um, I, my thoughts were, one, to do a life-size figure and take on that challenge in the development of, uh, of my skill and technique in, in, in sculpting, but also to express the idea of uh, how the continent of Africa had been um, exploited. And um, so it was actually to be one of a triptych. Uh, there were two other figures designed in the, in the composition. And this was the first one. Um, I was also at the time exploring uh, drawing, sculpting the human figure. I had a model, I think that expressed it very well. And um, I wanted to express how the continent, how black people um, had been exploited, had been raped, had been enslaved and generally exploited. So it was, the idea was to depict a strong, beautiful, vibrant, fertile, sexual, um, continent um, or a set of people had been exploited through history. So um, this, was, this was my theme. The, originally it was um, named Graceland, which was supposed to reflect Africa being um, the Graceland. And then the name changed um, to the Grace uh, as part of the three graces, the other two sculptures that were never, never really re actually realized. So that's that's the history story behind it. Mm -hmm. Alyssa, your question was: uh, Do you think these artworks create unique dialogues when exhibited in new ways at different galleries? And uh, I absolutely do believe that these works create. Uh, new dialogues, unique dialogues, as we move them from one place to another, um, as they move geographically from, uh, moved geographically from St. Petersburg to Tampa. Uh, one of the conversations that 
that comes to mind there is the idea that uh, both of those locations lack um, representation in, from the Black community in the arts as strong as it is of white representation. There are, I'm not aware of any Black curators at any of the museums in the Tampa Bay area. And so uh, moving the exhibition from the James Museum uh, to even the University of Tampa um, was an effort to uh, introduce the idea of Black works by Black people that talk about the struggles of those said people. And so the conversations and the dialogues happen as the people visit the works, um, as the people see the works. And uh, even though there are, there are labels that are there that tell the people what I, how I interpret uh, the pieces that were selected for the exhibition, um, there are still strong uh, messages from each one of the artists that I think is important for people to grasp as they're looking at the pieces. For example, uh, what Basil just explained about the grace. Um, I, the grace was actually kind of the, the pinning point for this exhibition for me, uh, because it was one of the first pieces that I found. Uh, and I remember seeing it um, and thinking, oh man, I really would love to have that piece, but I'm wondering how people are gonna react to seeing that. And what I saw when, um, when I saw that piece was um, exactly what it was, a black woman with her hands bound above her head. Um, and the, the, what that represented from the, from the standpoint of how people were, black people were brought from mother Africa to America. And it was through bondage. Um, and so, uh, having a woman bound adds an additional layer to it because there still is for women in general and especially black women, uh, a, a strong marginalization element that we have to break through. Um, and so having all of these messages, all of these uh, presented in one space was incredibly important for me and finding a way to get them all uh, into one space, given the fact that it's not been done. Um, and mind you, the space that was at the James Museum is actually just a little bit smaller than the entire space that the Woodson has available for all of the programming that they're doing currently. Um, I, I believe the community center that is currently the Woodson is only 4,000 square feet, where you've got 3,000 square feet of just a gallery at one museum here in the local area. And so if we speak to representation again, we have a disproportionate representation of blacks in the local area. And what has been done um, over the years to, to make that better has always come with a, a bitter pill. There's always been this give and take, give a little, while there's a little bit that's taken as well, and we just ignore the take. And so um, the dialogue is incredibly important as far as I'm concerned. And then to answer Bab's question about selecting the works, which I kind of did there, um, did I make any discoveries on the way? Absolutely, I made so many discoveries, and that is one of the reasons why the exhibition changed slightly um, when we moved from the uh, James Museum to the University of Tampa, we incorporated a few new artists at that point, and we also got some new work from Jeremy Bell. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, do with this exhibition was to try and capitalize on the idea that uh, Black art had an aesthetic. Um, and I wanted to dispel the notion that Black art was naive art or untrained art, or even that black art was just graffiti art, or there was some perceived notion that there was some aesthetic that only black people could do. And I wanted to include fine art. So we had Joyce J. Scott in there who's done, uh, she's an amazing artist who has spanned so many different mediums and she continues to do it. And uh, she does it with such grace and we have, um, 
uh, Thurman Statham, uh, a glass artist, one of the few glass makers that were glass artists that we have um, in, in America, um, coupled with Jeremy Bell and uh, so many other young artists that are up and coming in the local area. Jeremy, actually, I'm, I'm including you in the local area, brother, because you started out here in Tampa, okay? <laughs> At University of Tampa, that's my hometown. And I you know, was in St. Pete for a good while, and that's my spot, for sure. So, I mean, it's, it's incredibly important um, for, for all of us to engage thoughtfully the ideas of marginalization and consider how each one of us impact that conversation and how each one of us can better uh, engage and better uh, change or, or not better, but, but to change um, the situation there. And so that's, that's what motivated me on uh, many of the pieces that were selected in this as well. Um, so Terry, getting back to the capital campaign that you brought up earlier, um, it's, it's a lot. There's $27 million that need to be raised in order to build this building. Um, where are you guys now and how, what, what do you need? Money. Well, I now. think we've got everything we need here. We have 41 participants signed on. And if each of you give half million dollars, we can break ground tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, we are excited about where we are in our capital campaign. We uh, began the process of making our ask last month. And believe it or not, we are 5%. We've reached a 5% goal um, just within the past month or so. But with that, this is indeed a heavy lift if in fact we're expected to do it alone and we don't anticipate having to do so. When we consider we live in a extraordinary city, a fabulous county, a wonderful state, and a beautiful nation. If just each of those entities provided $5 million each, do you know how close we would be to our goal? And for anyone to suggest that our tax paying dollars are not something that we should consider within our state to enhance our cultural diversity in the arts, I think would certainly be short-sighted in such a thought. This extraordinary work of art was created by Mario Gooden, an African-American architect out of New York, who's partnering with Jason Jensen to create this wonderful edifice for us to preserve African-American art, history, and culture. In addition, I am proud to say, and while I've got the mic, um, Desmond, you made reference earlier to the 1619 Project. One of the programs that we host at the Woodson African American Museum happened to be the Woodson Warrior Scholarship Program. And our leader in that space, Jane Bunker, has secured Nicole Hannah Jones. Yes, Nicole Hannah wow. Jones, the individual who's responsible for the 1619 Project. And she will be here in St. Petersburg on March 27th. So I need you all to stay tuned and make yourselves, you know, ears up with regards to the location and the time as we're excited about the opportunity that we'll have to bring Ms. Jones to our area, but also the opportunity it presents for you to participate in giving and making available scholarships for deserving African-American youth within our community. So, it's not as heavy a lift as any of us might think because each of us knows someone. And if we all just pitch in, we will have a permanent location to show the extraordinary works of these individuals who are showcased here today and beyond. So we're counting on all of you. Amanda, I, I, I had more questions, but I think I'd like to see if we can get some questions from participants that are here. Yeah, I actually added one to the queue as well as, as a participant and interested party, right? Um, and I think that's the next one up. So this is for, for Basil. Um, your sculpture in our exhibition, The Race Run for Your Life, is this really wonderful and dynamic addition to the show. Um, would you talk about the meanings and motivations behind this particular piece? Uh, the Race evolved when I started doing 
um, a commission to to honor the late Herb McKinley, an athlete, Olympian, Jamaican Olympian, who won uh, multiple medals in the 48 and 52 Olympics. I started studying athletes uh, as well as studying him. And out of it came the recognition of the struggle of athletes and how it relates to life in general. Myself being an athlete in some respect, doing various athletic activity. Um, I know the, the character building aspects of athletics and how it relates to life in general. And so I came up with the concept of the entire race reflecting the various emotions, experiences, uh, victories and defeats that we go through in life in general. So it, become, it became an allegory for life in general. Uh, you have those, even, even the track that we are engaging on is part of the journey that we are in. Um, whether we are stuck to the track, it's a sticky track, it's a dry track, as we are experiencing in or, or learning about in, um, in 2020, 2021, 22, where not all people perform on the same type of track. We, some of us have a very sticky um, track, a very wet track to, to participate on and have a, a distinct disadvantage. So the, the whole idea of the race, uh, there is a, a saying in Jamaica, run for your life. Um, you, you're running for your life, your victory, your, to survive, um, not just running to, but running from. So here we have eight athletes representing the full um, standard athletic track, going through different emotions, um, some resigned, some still fighting, some uh, injured uh, and so on. Um, as we travel through life and out clear and in front, we have the victor who celebrates, but um, the, the race is not, you, you don't just race against yourself, you are within a society and within a community and um, your position is also relative to, to others. So basically I'm, I'm trying to explore um, life, the journey of, of life in itself. So this is what uh, developed. Thank you for that very layered and considered answer. And I think we have a couple fans also in the audience who are affirming as you were talking, um, Christian Fraser said that the artwork that you made is so beautiful and moving. Um, Michael Standard also thanked you and said, the fact that different combinations of materials move differently as you work with them is interesting. Um, Michael's not a visual artist, so it's really cool to hear about that process. So thank you for sharing that. Um, in the absence of another question, I, I kind of want to pose one to Jeremy as well. One thing we haven't talked about for the work you included for our exhibition CC is the, the symbol of the shields that, that kind of underpins or like bolsters those, uh, the figures. So could you talk a little bit about the addition of those symbols in your imagery? Well, so as Basil was talking, I'm shaking my head like, yeah, this thing called life is a race and we're running it for sure. And I'm thinking, wow, I think black people and maybe it's all people, but I know black people, sometimes we, we share these, these commonalities amongst us. And it's not even just an American black, it could be like the UK. It's something about, I don't know, but the shield kind of starts to speak to this notion of this long, arduous, sometimes painful race of this thing called life. And what are you doing to protect yourself? You know, um, I, I'm kind of thinking of the shield as kind of like um, um, a metaphor almost like, how are you guarding and protecting yourself as you are moving and navigating throughout 
um, the world. I mean, one really swift blow can change the trajectory of someone's life in a way that's unfathom unfathomable, you know? And so it's like, how do we remain guarded, but still open so that we can get the best out of life, but then protect ourselves as well so that we can run this race to the best of our abilities and finish it. So that's kind of what I was thinking about with the Shielded um, series, this notion that people are delicate, fragile, beautiful, and in need of some kind of mechanism um, to protect the mind, to protect the body, to protect the spirit, to protect the soul, so that um, we can do this to the best of our ability. So that's what I was thinking about at the time. Thank you. I think there's lovely parallels there in the sense of like vulnerability and openness, but also like strength, right? That you and, and Basil are talking about. Um, Desmond, is there any final thoughts you would like to ask as we wrap up tonight's event? Well, no, I think I, I think I got all my questions in. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Um, well, oh, Babs has her hand raised. Um, go ahead and, and type it into the chat, Babs, um, if you've got an additional question. Um, while you do that, uh, while I have the mic for just a moment, uh, I want to invite everyone to our next gallery event. On February 17th, we'll have an in-person event at the HCC Ybor City campus for a reception of Hyphenated Nature. It's a solo exhibition featuring artist Lillian garcia Roy, who's a Cuban-American artist and 2021 Guggenheim Fellowship recipient. Um, this event will be from five to eight with an artist lecture at the, in the middle, beginning at 6 p.m. Um, if you wanna stay all up to date with everything we've got going on at the HCC Art Galleries, more in-depth views of reverberations, for example, on our social media, just follow us at HCCFL underscore art galleries. I'm gonna see if Babs has her question in the chat yet, or if it was a missed hand raise. Um, okay, uh, Babs said he had, she had multiple questions for Desmond. We wanted to revisit that, um, we answered some of it, but she wanted to, ask you, Desmond, if you could talk a little bit more about the experience of curating this exhibition and the discoveries that you made. Be a nice like closing question. Wow. Um, well, the, the experience was, um, it was exhilarating. Uh, there was a, a lot to learn in the process of putting together an exhibition. Um, a lot I'm still learning and putting together an exhibition as well. Um, it was a lot to do in a short amount of time as well. Um, but one of the things that uh, Terry said so eloquently um, when we were talking about this was that uh, oftentimes Black people uh, plan almost this uh, right now for what's gonna be happening five minutes from now. <laughs> but I think she gave herself a little more time. I think she might've said something about planning today for what might be happening tomorrow because we don't always have that the liberty of time on our hands. And so um, the experience of putting together an exhibition as a curator, uh, first I had to wrap my head around the whole idea of being a curator. Um, and then what that meant and what I needed to do. Um, and just immediately thinking about what a show looked like when, when I'm working on the back end, putting the show up and that is writing the labels. Uh, and that meant doing the research on the pieces, finding out uh, not only what the artists thought about the pieces, uh, but also um, what I, how I'm tying all of these pieces together uh, and what is the story that I'm trying to tell um, as I'm tying these pieces together. And even that started to evolve over time because it was incredibly overwhelming um, designing a show, curating a show, coming up with how, what the layout was gonna be like. Um, and if it wasn't for uh, Thaddeus uh, being there to help with it, I probably would have lost my mind. <laughs> um, and so, uh, I, I don't want to say that it was an easy thing to do. Um, I feel like I got lucky in being able to do what I did um, because being a curator 
is a lot more than just grabbing a bunch of art and putting it on the walls. There's uh, being thoughtful about not only how you're putting the, the work on the walls, but also why you're putting the work on the walls and what are you trying to, um, what are you curating? What are you, what is the story that you're telling as you're putting all of these pieces together? Um, and for me, that story was um, all of the stories of so many black, brown and indigenous people uh, in America and trying to find a way to make each one of those stories, bring light to each one of those stories with the work that was made available to me. And there were so many great pieces um, in the original show and uh, that allowed me, that made it a little easier to put together the second show um, at the Scarf on Hartley Gallery at uh, University of Tampa where I then uh, got some new work from Jeremy, uh, brought in some uh, work from uh, Nick Davis, um, brought in some work from uh, Darnell Henderson that added yet another layer to the discussion, to the conversation that I was trying to uh, generate with this, with this exhibition. Um, and then um, to answer one of the other questions uh, that, that Babs asked about the end about putting together, how did I come up with the works that we were gonna put in the final show? Um, and it was, uh, oh, not the final show, I won't call it the final show, but this current show that is at, at, at Gallery 221. And it was primarily trying to find a way to, with the pieces that we had available, continue the, the discussion that began with that inaugural show at the James Museum and the grace was the, the beginning of the discussion. The grace is the end of the discussion. And uh, there are all of these pieces that are in the middle of the discussion that are uh, peppered uh, or, or pronounced with uh, Jeremy's work and with um, Anika Jones's pieces that are in there, the New American Revolution and Kamala Harris being in there and also uh, the, the piece um, of, for, by Basil of, of Dr. King, which is um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, it is a, a mock-up of the, the, the sculpture that is in downtown Atlanta as you approach the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And what's, what's poignant about that piece is that uh, it is, a, it is a, a sculpture of Dr. King with a bird uh, flying from his, being released from his hand. And Dr. King has said many times that, uh, and I'll quote him saying, we've learned to fly the air like birds. We've learned to swim the seas like fish. And yet we haven't learned to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. And so this exhibition, Reverberations, not only allows us to be able to revisit uh, what has happened in the past, but also to continue to have, uh, to start and continue the discussions that have, that have lain fallow for, for far too long. Um, what a wonderful way to, to end this conversation. Um, if you guys want to stick around for a little bit, first, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Um, Jeremy, Basil, Terry, Desmond, it's really an honor and a privilege for HCC to be hosting this conversation, for Jeremy and Basil, for your artworks to be in our space. I know it's been, as we, we noted before, really emotional and thoughtful provoking exhibition responses we've had with our students and our community so far. So and um, as we close our exhibition, and I thank you all, uh, invite everyone to come and see the show in person if you have not so far. And we'll play a slideshow of the installation documentation, but there's really no substitute for interacting directly with the artworks and, and learning more about the stories in that way and moving around the space and around the pieces. So with that, I hope this piques your curiosity. And again, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, truly an honor and a privilege. <laughs> Thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you very thank much, you. Amanda. Thank you, Des, and thank you, Jeremy and Basil. We're grateful. Thank you. Thank you, and you are very welcome. Honor is really mine. <laughs>